James, there, there's been a tremendous number of developments with the targeted therapies over the past few years. One thing that sometimes gets forgotten is that there are uh, some situations where chemotherapy really can be effective. I uh, want to turn to, to Jennifer. One of those areas are the, the poorly differentiated neuron carcinomas that we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you use chemotherapy in that setting? Right, so poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, as we discussed earlier, are a distinct uh, class aside from the well-differentiated tumors, and it has not been extensively studied. It's a rare uh, subgroup of all neuroendocrine tumors, accounting for somewhere around 10% of tumors. So it's very difficult to do clinical trials in this population. And historically, because the histology under the microscope has been similar to that seen in small cell lung cancer, we've really just extrapolated data from the small cell lung cancer literature to guide our treatments for, for the poorly differentiated population. And in the frontline setting, our, our go-to regimen is a combination of platinum therapy and etoposide. So that tends to be what we are using um, in the frontline setting for poorly differentiated tumors. Um, I think we don't know the answer as to whether or not that's correct. As we were discussing earlier, the, the biology of these tumors, we're learning more about it, and there are histologic similar, or similarities, but also some differences seen between the well-differentiated and poorly differentiated tumors, but also within the poorly differentiated tumors themselves, some differences between small cell and large cell. So we're learning a lot about that, and we're not sure if the platinum and etoposide chemotherapy is really the most appropriate for all of those patients. Uh, but it does remain our, our go-to option at this point. Can I ask a question as the non-medical -on oncologist in the room? Can we borrow some of our GI uh, chemotherapy um, regimens and possibly apply them to neuroendocrine? Just some thoughts about that? Like Folfox. For, for example, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for example. Sure. We Diane, can, do you, do you we ever can use it? we do. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, interestingly, one could question the role of next generation sequencing in 2016 and how um, beneficial it is, but what we're learning on the experimental side is um, a lot of the mutations we're identifying, for example, in a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma are very similar in traditional adenocarcinoma, APC, KRAS, um, BRAF. So um, we have often used 5-FU oxali or renal tkm based therapies with, with good responses. They're not, unfortunately, durable. Mm. So as is typical of these high-grade, poorly differentiated neuronal carcinomas, um, they can often very quickly um, progress. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that that point is very well taken that, again, the idea of lumping all these poorly differentiated neuronal carcinomas together is probably not the right thing to do, and that genetically, um, that their stem cell of origin, per se, is probably from an adenocarcinoma as opposed to a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. So, you know, there's, there's a, uh, a, a common wisdom, which is probably incorrect, that the, the high-grade aggressive tumors, because they're highly proliferative, respond to chemotherapy, and that the, the slower-growing, low-grade tumors don't respond to chemotherapy. That is probably not always correct. And in fact, we do use, in some situations, temozolomide for, uh, for newer, neuroendocrine tumors. Right, so specifically within the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor population, temozolomide has really become our go-to regimen for a lot of patients. Um, and I think it's one of the options that we definitely consider in patients who have a large degree of tumor burden and we're trying to really shrink their, their tumor down to a more manageable size. It's, uh, it's something that's not been um, definitively determined as of yet as to whether or not um, you know, we don't really know what the exact numbers are. Uh, the the study so far that's been reported looking at temozolomide therapy, um, as you know, you had participated and conducted two small um, phase two temozolomide-based studies that showed an initial response to temozolomide in 25 to 45 percent of patients, and that sort of prompted some some further investigation. What we largely have based our treatment uh, on at this point is actually a, a small retrospective study of 30 patients who had received a combination of temozolomide and capecitabine for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, where a pretty impressive response rate of 70% was seen and a progression-free survival of 18 months. So amongst all of the options that we have, that's definitely a very promising one. And I think us as a community have really adopted temozolomide 
um, or temozolomide-based regimens as, as a go-to regimen. Um, fortunately, we are looking at that in a prospective fashion now um, in an ongoing cooperative group trial looking at temozolomide versus temozolomide and capecitabine. So hopefully that'll give us some guidance as to what's really the, the more favored regimen. Right. Ms. Jennifer, I just wanted to chime in that um, I'm always, always a little bit leery of very high response rates from retrospective oh, absolutely. series. So I think that question in my mind, I have no doubt temozolomide is active in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but you know, the exact response rate and whether it should be used in combination with single agent, to me, we still have to wait for the ECOC study to yes. you know, review its results. Um, and uh, I think we, as a field, really need to discourage uh, treatment decision being made on small retrospective series uh, at this time point because you know, the fields move beyond that now. But uh, I also want to get back to a earlier point of discussion, which is the, the poorly differentiated regimens. We talked about a number of different chemotherapy regimens to be considered, but you know, I, I just wanted to, to mention that you know, this group of tumor occasionally you can cure with cytotoxic chemotherapy, very small percentage, five, 10 percent of the patients, even in the setting of distant metastatic disease. So I think uh, until we have more data back uh, from the prospective study, uh, probably platinum-based chemotherapy is still probably the front line rather than going to targeted agents or other, um, other, other types of treatment. Yeah, and I would highlight that I'm sure you mean curative attempt because of the platinum-based therapy as opposed to surgery, um, because generally yeah. these poorly differentiated neuronal carcinomas should not be taken to surgery, even in what would be considered locally or locally advanced situation. I mean, certainly if you're worried about obstruction, that's different for palliative reasons than it could be indicated. But generally speaking, even when we think it's local, um, we will always consider a platinum, typically platinum metoposide based therapy first uh, before proceeding to a surgical intent um, because we know that the risk of metastatic disease is so high.